Petro, President of, President of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I want to welcome you to our program uh, today where we're going to talk about Brexit. How's it going? What's the latest status report? What does it mean both for the UK and for the rest of um, rest of the European Union? Um, our, this program is a members forum that it's meant to be small so that all of you can ask questions directly. Um, so it's, it's uh, one of your benefits of being a member of the World Affairs Council. And I really appreciate everybody who's a member of the council and please tell your friends to join. Our moderator today is Ramesh Subramaniam, who is a long, you've been a member of the World Affairs Council for how long, Ramesh? I think uh, pretty much since it started. Yeah, so good. Yeah, he was a, he was a youngster um, when he joined the World Affairs Council. Now I look at it. Uh, Ramesh is going to be our moderator. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Ramesh. And uh, Ramesh is a, it's a business consultant. And I'm going to turn this program over to you right now, Ramesh. Thanks, Ambassador Charles. Thank you so much. And um, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. As uh, Ambassador Charles said, it's always a, it's fun to have the members forum because this is you know, a chance to, for you to directly ask questions. Um, so I'm really thrilled here with the panel that we have, the speakers we have. Uh, Davy Young is the, the managing director of Oxford Analytica, and uh, more importantly, a huge friend of the World Affairs Council has been uh, uh, spoken to us at many times, uh, and we've always sort of um, enjoyed learning about what's happening with the UK and the Brexit. And um, joining him is uh, Niall Young. Um, Davey, in, in, even before he was the uh, managing director of Oxford Analytica, spent a lot of time in, uh, writing about and, and uh, on matters of international security, technology, emerging markets. And Niall has written extensively on politics and international relations. Uh, interestingly, his focus is nationalism and democracy. And so this is perfect uh, you know, context for Brexit and what we are talking about. So thanks both of you for being here today. And uh, Davey, what I thought since the last time you did a great job of setting the Brexit for us and telling and handicapping the odds of what's going to happen uh, before the elections. And now fast forward two years, if you wouldn't mind just sort of setting the stage of where are we now and uh, before we sort of dive into the future state. Sure, Ramesh, thank you. And Ambassador Shapiro, great to be back. Great to see you. I'm Sorry, we're not all in person, but um, at some point, at some point soon, I, I hope. I think the last time we met, it was before COVID. Yes. Um, Theresa May was still prime minister. Um, uh, Niall was advising me behind the scenes on what was happening on the ground. So it's great for Niall to actually join this this cool kind of in, in person from Dublin to um, so you'll get the 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 best analysis that Oxford Analytica has to offer. But um. Yeah, just to kind of bring everyone up to speed, uh, December 31st, 2020, um, documents were, were signed and the following day, um, the UK ends up leaving, uh, leaving the EU. And I've, I was writing down over the weekend, you know, uh, was it the end of the matter? You know, was it all <laughs> done and dusted and solved? Absolutely not. Um, multiple issues remain, many of the same issues remain. Um, and much uncertainty um, exists around everything to do with, with Brexit. So I just wanted to touch on a couple kind of very high level points um, and then pull in Niall uh, to start getting into the weeds a little bit more and then we'll open it up for, for questions. But the, the top of my list at the moment in terms of when we look at key issues or themes around Brexit is certainly the, the interwoven na nature now between Brexit and COVID. Um, and I say interwoven because many of these issues that we were talking about a year and a half, two years ago with regards to Brexit are many of the same issues related to, to COVID. So you start looking at um, productivity, trade, especially the movement of services, goods and people. Um, and I think this isn't a shock to anyone, but COVID has um, certainly 
um, thrown a spanner in the works um, and exacerbated any tensions that we were chatting about two years ago with regards to the movement of services, goods and people from the UK to the EU and even within the UK as we start looking at, at Northern Ireland. Um, when we talk about Northern Ireland, um, and now we'll get into the details here a little bit more, but um, years ago, uh, Northern Ireland can, uh, was a very contentious issue when it came to Brexit and what they should be doing, especially around the movement of goods, people and services. Um, now that issue continues. Uh, we refer to it now as the Northern Ireland Protocol. And again, this is between you know, all the negotiations and debates that are going on in terms of what role um, should Northern Ireland play, especially when it comes to border protection um, and trade zones. So we'll get into some more of those details, but that's the second key theme I wanted to mention. Uh, a third theme here, and this again came up two years ago, was um, the growing desire for independence. And at the time we were speaking specifically about Scotland, um, that has only grown um, and it has, I think, spread. Speaking to Niall uh, last week, it's not only concerning Scotland, but also some other areas of the UK, including Wales. So we can get into to any questions that you may have on, on, on that front. A couple other things just to mention here. Um, again, just keep in mind that it is very hard to separate now Brexit out from COVID and what the ramifications and, and impact have been, but you've definitely got issues and themes around productivity. You've got issues and themes around trade. You've got issues and themes about employment. Um, and then the last one here, uh, and it relates to trade, but just relations between countries. And, and the, the most notable one that I know will come up as a, as a question later is, you know, relations between not just the UK, and the EU, but now, and then also the UK and the US with a whole new presidency um, in place on the US side, but also now, um, you know, we're bringing in Australia <laughs> with regards to what's happening with submarines and just listening to the news this morning and you look at Australia, France, the US and the UK and the tensions that are now boiling under the surface. Um, and again, these trade relations and these bilateral conversations ongoing definitely um it's hard to analyze them without thinking about brexit and what what position the uk would have been in before and what position they are in now you know trying to drive down this more isolationist route of brexit but now they're realizing my goodness look we're living and operating in a global ecosystem how does that impact our foreign policy decisions. So those are a few of the, the key themes and issues, um, almost all of them remaining from before when Brexit was signed. They have just manifested themselves over time in, in different ways that we'll get into. So let me pause here, um, introduce uh, Niall, uh, just for some opening comments and thoughts on, on those themes now or any other themes that you think may be of interest. Thanks, Davey. And Ramesh, first of all, it's great to be here with you all and look forward to our discussion over the next hour or so on Brexit and, and the future um, for the United Kingdom. So I'm just going to talk a little bit really about um, how alive Brexit still is. So while Brexit um, in formal terms, in terms of formal processes, is, is, is done through the withdrawal agreement and, and the, the, the trade agreement, the politics of Brexit is a strong um, as it's ever been, um, if not stronger. Um, British people's political affiliations are now uh, based on, on, um, the, on, on the questions over Brexit, on positions regarding uh, Brexit, rather than affiliations towards any of the, um, any of the political parties. Um, any tension between the EU and the UK is often exaggerated and spun by Britain's conservative supporting press to justify the Leave vote, and likewise, on the other side, any example where the EU is performing better, let's say even in terms of the EU countries having fewer issues with, 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 um, with supply chain uh, shortage or driver shortages, that's used by um, EU supporting press to, to justify the Remain vote. And the public and media opinion um, has been fueled by the government's politics and policy over Brexit since coming to power under 
um, Prime Minister Johnson in 2019 um, in an effort to remind um, some examples in terms of how the government is driving um, is, is trying to keep Brexit very much in, in public debate in an effort to remind British voters of their new sovereignty. Conservative politicians are now often seen um, beside, beside um, symbols such as uh, British flags. And, um, and what's quite interesting is that um, this has had such a big impact that in recent months, the, the, Labour, the, opposition, uh, the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, has made um, a deal, um, has made a big deal being seen in public um, with Union Jacks, um, uh, with, with, with his own Union Jack uh, flag um, as well. And other examples of where the government is trying to remind um, voters of, of Brexit and trying to reinforce the symbolism of Brexit is um, a few months ago when the government sent gunboats to Jersey following tension with French fishermen, as well as um, the um, as well as trying to um, um, put um, the, the, the crown symbol back on pint glasses. So there are some of the examples where symbolism is becoming really important, and that's likely to remain. Um, and this politics of sovereignty and symbolism um, are having a really damaging impact on the UK's relations with the EU. Um, so uh, this is where um, I'll talk a little bit first um, about Northern Ireland. So um, in order to avoid um, a border between the North and the South of Ireland, um, the EU and the UK agreed in, in uh, 2019 that Northern Ireland would remain in the EU single market for goods. And this was agreed under the Northern Ireland Protocol. So in effect, this would create a regulatory and customs border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now, at the time, the UK government needed a Brexit deal because they're going into an election in December 2019 and get Brexit done was the, was the main slogan. And to get Brexit done, they needed a Brexit deal. So that deal was signed. But now, now that the implementation of the protocol is, is supposed to be happening and we're seeing lots of issues in terms of trade tension between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as well as a lot of political opposition in Northern Ireland from unionist politicians and communities. And the UK and now, just before, sorry, but sorry to interrupt, yeah. but before you go forward on the, the future part of it, um, I thought maybe you can just take a minute, if you don't mind, is just I know on, in the press, you know, you all, at least from here, when we look at it, we get sort of segments of it. You know, I, I, I've been reading about the fact that, you know, the, the impact on jobs, like Paris is beating London for jobs in banking and finance. I read about, you know, product choice changes and the costs are being increased and product mixes being reduced. And I know the, over the weekend, you know, gas shortages came up as a big deal. Are those and the supply chain problem, are those very rare and sporadic or is it more systemic? I mean, what's your sense of the jobs and product choice and supply chain issues? Um, is it more broader or very um, ad hoc I, here? I think at the moment, the issues in terms of imports aren't as bad as they're going to be um, next year because the UK has decided not to impose the same checks that the EU are imposing on British exports to the EU uh, to and um, the EU. So at the moment, most of the damage has been felt by exporters, by businesses, and that's obviously also having an impact on consumer choice because it, it works and um, both ways. But the issues in terms of net now there already is reduced choices on offers for consumers, and what we're seeing particularly in relation to supply chains and. And um, in terms of driver shortages, that's very uh, much related to um, and the, the new immigration system, which is really reducing the, the number of, of EU drivers in the UK. And that's not easily rectified. The UK, uh, it, um, obviously, over the next few years, will want more British people to be doing those jobs and pay them better. But that's not easily rectified. But in terms of consumer choices, while they, um, while they are reduced and there are supply chain issues, um, the, the big, I think, impact at the moment is on businesses and exporters because EU has imposed all the different non-tariff barriers on 
trade with the UK, the UK government recognizing that the damage that this would have in the context of COVID and all the other issues is saying, well, let's not do this for the moment because then we're, we just make the situation worse. But just, um, will I go back to Northern Ireland briefly just to talk yeah, yeah, sure. about, no, but, about, yeah, about yeah, the trust? I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Just, but, but yeah. just so, so as it relates to that, so great. I, I hear what you're saying that it's, you know, it's because of, the UK has kept the borders, you know, not not putting as much controls from what's coming from the EU. The impact is not as much there. What about the the immigration system in terms, of especially the shortage of the lower skilled jobs? Yes. Um, you know, the things that used to be a lot of people would come from Central or Eastern Europe and so on. How is that being handled uh, now? And so under the new Brexit immigration system, so Brexit featured very strongly in the in the 2016 referendum um, and in order to, um, to to deal with that and this government has pursued under Boris Johnson has pursued a very hardline approach towards immigration where it wants to where it's introduced a points-based system which makes it very hard for EU people who are coming for the first time to so those who are living in the UK before Brexit were able to remain under the set of status scheme but for new people who would right. like to come and um, unless they uh, pass a certain threshold in terms of education, in terms of skills, and in terms of salary expectations, it, um, they basically can't come into the UK. And they would have done a lot of Polish, Romanians, Bul Bulgarians, Czechs, um, would, have, um, would have worked in a lot of the lower skill areas in hospitality, in, um, as truck drivers, um, in construction. Um, and... Um, there has been a, a massive redu uh, reduction in those workers in the UK. And that was, I think, also fueled as well by COVID-19 because a lot of people would have went home. So the, so the UK hadn't, um, had just properly left um, the, the, um, the EU in terms of the, the withdrawal agreement and the trade agreement. And then they formally left just around the same time as um, COVID-19. But um, a lot of workers who might have otherwise stayed and applied for the settled status scheme um, have returned back, as a lot of people all over the world went back to family, they went back to a home setting, um, and, and they haven't returned. So that's also been exacerbated by um, COVID-19. So one of the big issues now um, that the UK is facing is labour shortages, because it, it, it's quite a similar situation in Ireland where, where Irish people... Um, aren't prepared to do some of the jobs that foreign workers are prepared to do. Um, and that's something that just can't change overnight because also these were these have been traditionally lower paid jobs. Yeah. And um, and uh, basically, if those workers um, aren't in the country anymore, well, then inevitably it'll lead to, to labor shortages. So that's what the UK is, is experiencing now. And that's been exacerbated by uh, COVID-19. Now on the flip side, um, the, the new immigration um, the, the, the new uh, immigration points-based system is aimed to attract higher skilled, higher educated workers from uh, non-EU countries. So more Indians, more Australians, more Americans who work in, 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 in the services areas, in, in technology, in these kind of also strategically important areas going forward, so that's so, so, so that's the that's the flip side, um, and of and the impact of that hasn't been seen yet. It's obviously been very difficult to travel and to move sure. country. So that's something that we could um, that that we might start seeing more of over the next few years. No, but I, that's not going to offset all the shortages in the other areas because they're different areas essentially. The um, where this labor shortages are in low skilled areas, this point space system isn't intended to attract lower skilled workers, right? It's, it's right. aimed to attract workers in higher and um, from, um, you know, with, with higher levels of education in different oh, areas. It's, it's, it's Stevie, I'm just going to add one point in terms of is it is it your opinion that policies related to COVID and the furlough schemes are kind of masking and hiding? the significance and the impact of labor shortages? And um, so I think a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, the government 
and and the government supporting media, I think, have made a big um, issue of pointing to any issues uh, as blaming COVID nineteen for it to 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 um, to distract maybe from the the impact that Brexit is is having in terms um, in terms of those shortages. So I think there's been a big effort in terms of that. I think COVID nineteen has certainly um, has certainly um masked you know some disruption in terms of services where you'd have people traveling to different countries and also in terms of um in terms of the trade in goods and i think also because everyone has sort of been in the same boat every country in, in the western world has been in the same boat regarding covid 19 pursuing similar policies you know under the same kind of uh pressures it regards to lockdown so that's that, that's being yeah. predominantly the focus but now that we're getting back to a normal world i think this is where okay. the real test of brexit is going to um emerge over the next year or two how much how much of those d- disruptions now are are, are 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 just to do with brexit and nothing else yeah. and also in terms of services where you uh, and the uk is a predominantly services-based um economy uh, where, where people under the under the passporting scheme in the EU, where you could travel freely, where business could operate, a services business could operate in any other EU member state and move around freely. Now that travel is going to be back, where where are we going to be in terms of that? So it's Got masked it. it to some degree, but um, um, but I think now over the next year or two, as we start, unless of course we we're, we're faced with a new variant very potent variant it brings us sure. back to 2020 again i think certainly and um, brexit and its impact is going to become a lot more um visible got it so thank you now that was really helpful so i think so at least now we have a good sense of you know what the impact of brexit is as it is today what's how it is impacting you know jobs product choice supply chain etc and uh, now I really would like to pick up where you were going with the, the Northern Ireland protocol and saying, you know, what do you think will be the outcome of the talks that are currently going on to resolve the tension? I know there's still, you know, we've, we've sort of had some grace period extension on some things through September. So you've got yeah. some, 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 we've got some breathing room now, but as, <laughs> as, as go between now and September, how do you think that is going to go and how is it going to, so how important is that to resolve the tension overall between the UK and the EU relations? Yeah, so saying kind of as part of my broader point about um, about the politics of Brexit and trust. So Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol is now basically dominating consuming EU-UK relations. Um, so the protocol is saying effectively creates a regulatory and customs border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, but the UK government now want fundamental change because, well, because there's a lot of unionist backlash to the protocol in Northern Ireland. They see it as essentially separating the United Kingdom from Northern Ireland, but there's also a lot of, uh, there's also a lot of disruptions in terms of trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And most of that uh, disruption is related to to the trade of of agri-food, which which is accounted for about 85% of trade disruptions. Now the UK wants basically to rewrite the protocol and have uh, and and it wants the EU to completely reconfigure how it assesses risk, and um, in terms of goods going from a non-EU territory like the UK into the single market, and um, whereas the the, U, uh, the EU only wants moderate change, maybe to simplify customs procedures. Now the EU um, would like. The UK to sign up to its uh, site on phytosanitary uh, rules, which are rules about food safety, um, and the UK government is strongly opposed to this because for for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, the, the 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 politics of, que- of Brexit, the question of sovereignty, and um, yeah. is as very much at the front of this. Uh, no, we left the EU because we wanted to get away from EU rules and 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 uh, make our own rules and follow our own rules but also fears that if it signed up to the to EU rules on a temporary or permanent basis that then that would maybe undermine its efforts to sign a trade deal say with the United States which has strong issues with EU food rules 
So um, that's where we are at, at the moment. On that front now, a question for you. So I know there's e e the UK is trying to sort of position more, you know, the 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 relevant, the, the, you know, the the what is it? This, this the the similarity or whatever the term I'm, I'm forgetting the, the the relevance or whatever of the rules as it exists in the UK are similar to the ones in the EU. Um, they are, but that they are at the moment. But the the, the because there's lack of little trust between both sides, and because the UK can diverge in terms of regulations in the future, that's that that's that's the main concern on the EU part. So the EU is taking a very zero risk approach to um to the protocol, and um, and even though what the UK is trying to say is, well, look. We, we follow the same rules. We are only in yeah, the, the, uh, the, the equivalence is, I think, the term they use in equivalence of the of the of the yeah, uh, but, UK but, role. But the yeah. EU is insisting that they sign up to something. Uh, they sign up to a situation uh, to a to a regime where they follow uh, EU food safety rules, whether on a permanent or temporary basis. EU have put that forward, saying that it can be on a temporary basis, and then when you are in advanced negotiations with a trade partner, well, then you can leave if you want and we can kind of deal with it then. But it also buys more time and it reduces attention right now. But I just think quickly in terms of where we're going. And um, throughout the year, grace periods have been extended. And these are periods where, where checks would, 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 uh, would start to happen on goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland as part of the implementation. Now, the UK has unilaterally extended these uh, grace periods and um, now I think that's part of a tactic to eventually to, to every time a deadline comes up let's let's extend the grace periods and then eventually we'll have to maybe renegotiate it completely but I think we're at the stage yeah. now where the e, where the where the EU um, is kind of fed up with the continuous extension of these grace periods that if a solution can't be found over the next six months we could be at a situation where and um, where the EU imposes tariffs on, on UK imports as part of retaliation because it's entitled to retaliate under the Brexit agreements, um, as well as legal action. Now, they have commenced legal action and they're doing this kind of twin approach of legal action and, uh, and trying to find a solution to the protocol. Um, but I think that's where we are. Damage is so, uh, trust is, is at very, very low levels that it would be difficult that there will and um, it'll be difficult to, to see um, some kind of agreement coming. Mm -hmm. And it's now at the stage where it's spilling over into other aspects of EU, UK Got it. trading and political relationship. Okay, thanks. I think now I'd like to sort of, I know I have, I have a lot more questions and maybe yeah. I'll come back in the end, but I'd have to sort of open the uh, floor to other people to have questions, because that's I think the fun part of the members forum. So anybody that would like to, Ask a question if you please raise your hand. I hopefully I can see it, um, and then um, I, I can you you can what I would suggest in that case you would unmute your phone and then uh, or your computer and then uh, ask a question directly of either Davy or Niall. Um, that that's the best way to do that. I just want to remind people that if you use there's a raise your hand function on Zoom. It's at the bottom of your screen. Where it says reactions, click on that, and then you can click on raising your hand. And, and I think Ramesh will see it if you put it on. Ah, the now I do. I see it. So, Angela, uh, if you, please go ahead. Yes, I have a question. For the average family in Ireland now, um, how is Brexit affecting them? I know with COVID here in the States, like today, I just read that Walmart is starting to uh, ration water and... Um, and I think it was toilet paper again, but um, so with Brexit, are they still looking at the EU as their primary trading partner and how is day-to-day -day, day -day life affected? So um, our, so Ireland as, as a member um, of the EU is strongly affected by the new trade agreement between the EU and the UK and, and all the new non-tariff barriers concerning uh, concerning regulations and paperwork and customs controls and so on, because why Ireland is the worst affected country out of all the out of all EU member states is because um is because the United Kingdom is Ireland's main trading partner and a lot of our uh, goods and uh, consumer choices come from the UK and 
well Northern Ireland as well, which is um which um which um is, we're, we're on the same island, so there's a lot of trade between the south and the north. So especially in terms of consumer choices, there's been uh, quite um, a big impact. But in terms of politics, I think Ireland's become more pro-EU um, as a result of Brexit because we see the kind of, well, well Irish people, um, they um, are very much, um, um, what's the word there? And Brexit has become, is such an ongoing issue in the UK media uh, and seeing what's happening over in the UK and kind of polarizing the impact that Brexit has had um, on the United Kingdom. Um, Ireland uh, and Irish people have kind of become closer to the EU saying, no, this is what we want. And this is quite an interesting thing regarding Europe more generally. Um, countries that once wanted to leave, to leave the EU are populist parties in other countries that wanted to leave the EU. They're no longer advocating that position. Yeah. Um, now that's for many different reasons, but um, it's something that, that's quite comparative across the EU. Um, so no, politics, I, I think we're closer to the EU, and, but then also in terms of economics, we're, we're, we're already seeing um, an, an, a strong, um, strong issues there. But because Northern Ireland will remain in the EU for goods, I think there'll be a lot more sourcing of, um, of supply chains in Northern yeah. Ireland away from mainland Great Britain. That, that that might put some interesting, you know, implications for the referendums in the future, um, in terms of yeah, what's happening. There. It's particular in terms of independent potential independence yeah. referendums. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, Brexit has um, fueled support in Scotland for independence. Now, up until recently, most opinion polls showed a majority in favour of Scottish independence. But Brexit also makes the path to Scottish independence more difficult. Be because, because of the nature of Brexit, in terms of the, the hardline Brexit pursued by the British government, um, an independent Scotland that joins EU would trigger a hard border between Scotland yeah. and England, because yeah. there's very little convergence at the moment between the EU and the UK. Okay. So that would cause a lot of immediate disruption for, for, for consumers, for commuters, for um for for um anyone crossing the border but also the economic relationship between scotland and england so while it has fueled support for independence it also makes it a little bit more difficult than say right. if if the uk pursued a softer brexit where that border could remain open in the event that an independent scotland joined the european union okay that makes sense uh jorge um you had a question if you'd unmute. There you yeah, go. Please. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this is a question for David. Uh, uh, David, could you expand a little bit on the um, UK, US, Australia deal vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis what's happening with the EU, please? <laughs> yeah, and I'll definitely bring Niall in here. We were chatting about this on uh, at the end of last week um, and just catching up on developments um, uh, over the weekend. Um, I think the one thing I want I, I want to emphasize here as well because it's it's also very this deal and the issue with Australia, you know, having kind of in some way, shape, or form committed to the front to, to France to buy the submarines, now changing their mind and going with the US and the UK. Um, one around this issue around trust, um, especially in these bilateral and multilateral agreements. Um, and listening to Niall and just hearing how important trust is in these Brexit negotiations, something like this uh, is definitely not helping. It's definitely not helping build and cement the trust between nations at all. Um, I think the other interesting thing, and I was reading about it this morning, in fact, is there is what is the future role of the UK in the world? You know, they they pursued Brexit to try and let's say control their 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 end game, their destiny more, being a little bit more isolationist and protectionist, but now in tandem with the US realizing, okay, what's, how, what's happening with China? How do we manage China? What's happening in the South Pacific? Um, you almost see kind of a, a balance between, okay, let, let's protect our own, but also we've got to be a major player globally. Um, the, the piece I read this morning, and now you and I were chatting about this on Thursday and Friday of last week, that 
the UK probably would have taken a different um, policy or at least plan of attack should, would they have been in the EU at this time? But because they're out of the EU, there is this necessity to really look after your own self-interests um, and to be more individual in accomplishing those those objectives. So there's just a couple, yeah. a, a couple kind of initial bits of, of feedback. I don't know the terms in detail, but now anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I think you're right. Like in different times, the UK would have consulted and cooperated with European allies regarding development. Why? Because the Indo-Pacific is now the new battleground for global geopolitical influence, and it constitutes um, a seminal area of mutual interest for, for Western countries. And it's interesting, actually, after the AUKUS announcement, um, what Boris Johnson was saying, and it was that, well... AUKUS is about global security, and that means that it's it's crucial for everyone, including and um, including Europe, suggesting that also um, AUKUS could be something could be seen as a basis to build upon, and maybe other it could be the beginning of a broader Western cooperation in the um, in the Pacific that could include maybe countries like France and Germany. Um, however, given the little trust that exists within Europe, uh, within the EU, within EU countries towards the UK, the UK's participation in AUKUS is viewed purely through the lenses of mistrust, suspicion, hostility. Um, and it also raises big concerns in European capitals regarding the United Kingdom becoming a post uh, competitor both post Brexit. Now, well, there's a lot of secrecy around AUKUS and the UK's role in it and how much of a player it will be in it. Um, the, the EU sees the UK trying to, you know, compete with, with Europe, with the EU yeah. on, on, on a global scale. And this is kind of reinforcing those suspicions that, that the UK will become a post-Brexit competitor. And that will also maybe reduce the scope of flexibility regarding future EU-UK trade relations. I was talking earlier about the EU's position towards risk. It will take more, it's more likely to take a zero risk approach when it comes to trade relations with the UK, if it doesn't trust the UK, and at the moment sure. it doesn't, but I think, um, yeah, I think it, I think it's all about trust. I think, um, if if there was better trust between both, um, between um, between the EU and the UK, the UK might have consulted the EU, and the UK or, and the EU could view AUKUS through um, the lenses of of maybe greater opportunity and um, to to cooperate with Western allies regarding. China's influence in the Indo-Pacific, but because the trust right. is low at the moment, this is how, and um, this, this is how uh, the EU is viewing. Okay, August. that makes that makes good sense. Keith, you had raised your hand. Um, I know you dropped your hand off, but you have an op still have a question. Keith Valentine. It was related to Scotland. He, he immediately answered it before. Uh... <laughs> you know, it, and Wales, is, is there any difference today in life in Scotland versus uh, England from uh, Brexit? Um, not really, because they, they've been impacted the same yep. as um, as a result um, of Brexit. Now, in Scotland, because... Um, because the fishermen have been impacted there more from um, from the impact of Brexit in terms of fishing exports to the EU, and um, that that certainly um, ha had an impact. But what's, what's interesting about the fisheries question is many fishermen voted for Brexit because they're taken in by the argument that they would get more fish, um, and that they'd be able to maybe retain the market. But they'll they'll get more fish, but they'll they'll lose market access to the EU. And um, in terms of the independence question, I think what's really interesting is about three, well, before Brexit, Welsh independence never really exceeded 10%. Now it's at around 30%, low base, wow. but still a big jump. If you, if you look at it just over that, um, sure. that, yeah, over that short period of time. And the demographics is really interesting as well in, in Wales, as well as Scotland. It's um, the vast majority of, of young people, those between 16 to say 30, 34, are, are, are supporting independence. And if that 
trend continues, that would suggest that you would have more independence voters over, over the next number of years. And I don't think the Welsh in, uh, and I don't think Welsh independence is as big of an issue for the UK government as Scottish independence because um, because there's no um, party in the Welsh government that wants a referendum in independence. Um, so whereas in Scotland, the government of Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish National yeah. Party um, have said that they'll hold a refer uh, an another um, another referendum on independence by 2023. So that's an imminent, you know, challenge to the UK government, and it's a big strategic challenge for Boris Johnson. How does he tackle that? That makes that makes sense. Now, thanks for that information. Now, Ambassador Shapiro, I know you had a question. Um, yeah, I do. Thank. And it has to do with, you said that uh, political parties in the UK are becoming less important uh, and that pro and anti-Brexit sentiment is more important than political affiliation. Right. US media may be oversimplifying, uh, equivalated, equi made resentment equivalent to pro Brexit uh, vote. You know, the people resentment, resentful towards London, resentful towards the elites, resentful towards the people who are doing well. Um, how's that, how, how does all that play out over time? Is there going to be a realignment of parties, uh, new parties? Does uh, Nigel Farage take over a party? I mean, what, what, what happens now? Well, Nigel Farage came back with the Brexit party which is all about pursuing a harder form of Brexit after following Theresa May's government and her difficulty in, in getting Brexit done. And, um, and the Conservatives have basically forced Nigel Farage to, to retire from, from party politics because, well, they hijacked a lot, of his, a lot of his agenda, a lot of his kind of politics. And I think now, um, I think in general, right across the board, affiliation to parties in decline, but particularly in the UK, and I think the new focus really is on culture and identity. Where do you stand on issues uh, surrounding even things like like woke? Uh, you, you, that's a big issue yeah. now in in the United States as well. And the, one of the UK government's priorities is is the war on woke and to make fee people feel proud to be British. But it's obviously defined in very kind of narrow conservative through narrow conservative um, lenses. So. Yes, it's where the it's, it's where the part it's where particular party stands in relation to identity, in relation to culture. The traditional left-right divide over economic issues is isn't is, isn't um, really as strong anymore. The connection between the Labour Party and workers and the trade union movement is is, is completely different to to what it used to be. And the realignment um, was seen in twenty nineteen really for the. Uh, on such a grand scale for the first time when you had so many traditional Labour voters going over to Conservative. And at the time it was that, oh, well, that was because of Brexit um, and and that uh, and things might work themselves out over time and, and the old party uh, or, or old um, voting behaviour will, will, will kind of go back. But the local elections this year show that actually the Conservatives are managing to hold on to a lot of those voters and there was a by-election in the south of England in, in a traditional well-to-do conservative area that the conservatives lost so there could also be they could so the conservatives could also start to lose seats in kind of the wealthier and more uh, and more cosmopolitan um, constituencies um, and I think um, yeah it's, it's all around culture and identity and I think that it goes back to also the symbol, symbolism of Brexit, whether it's Union Jacks, gunboats, the crown on the pint glass. There's a strong sense that uh, that, that national um, identity um, is, is, is really, really important. And, that, and one of the best ways to, to, to hold on to uh, our, new, our new voters is by kind of reinforcing the symbolism of, of Britain and of Brexit, but it's obviously in, in quite narrow terms because Ramesh, not everyone... can I, no, yeah, just what one is is an English identity being awoken as well? Yeah, so talking about flags. I mean, it, again, I see very small uh, 
view of, of the UK, but it seems to me like I'm seeing a heck of a lot more English flags as a, yep. uh, now than in the past. That's that's right. And um, and English uh, national identity is, is growing. It's very different from that to Welsh and Scottish national identity is um, people who would say uh, to find themselves as more English and British would be would, would be kind of the older generations. But Brexit is very much seen as as a as a English um, an English nationalist um, um, project rather than one for for British sovereignty. And I think um, English nationalism and national identity has become more assertive. Um, since devolution in 1997 and the rise of Scottish nationalism. But I also think um, in turn, um, the, the, the notion in Scotland and Wales that Brexit is, is pure, purely for British interests is also reinforcing national identity in those countries. So they're kind of working off and um, off each other in that sense. And I think as long as, as Brexit is viewed as only serving English interests in the in the Scottish and Welsh governments. Then I think, um, then then I think independence in those countries could well continue to, to remain stable or, or, or rise, or at least national identity will become more entrenched in those countries. Sure. No. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think I think we are we are at time. Time's gone by pretty fast. So. Um, Davey and I'll thank you so much. Ambassador Shapiro, should I turn it over to you to, to, for closing comments? Yeah, let me, thank you. Ramesh, thank you so much for moderating. You, you did my normal job better than I do my normal <laughs> job. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, you've got a future ahead as a moderator. And Niall and Davey, let me, let me thank both of you. This has been great, very insightful, useful. I mean, sort of, uh, you know, Americans are fascinated with the UK and with Brexit, and you've certainly given us a, a lot of new information to think about uh, that's been super, super useful. I hope you'll join us again, not just to talk about Brexit, but to talk about other issues as well. Um, Oxford Analytica doesn't just, I mean, it pays attention to the whole world. You've got experts on, you name the topic, Oxford Analytica has, has got the experts, and we really appreciate that. And Davey, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I also want to thank our team. Um, want to thank our producer, Valerie Lopez de Frank, our um, social media manager, Laura Brower, and um, the executive producer, who is Hina Rennie. She's done a great job with us. All of them are terrific. We've got a program coming up Thursday at noon Eastern time. I don't want you to miss this with Constanza Stelzenmiller, who is an expert on Germany. Actually, she's, I think, probably the foremost US expert on, expert on Germany living in the US because she's German. Uh, she's at the Brookings Institution. And obviously we're gonna talk about the elections and the result of the German elections and what it means. The title of the program is All Eyes on, on Germany. It's going to be Thursday at noon. Um, and I also want to recommend, I sent you the link. Uh, we had a program last Thursday with David Rennie, who is the Economist magazine correspondent in Beijing, in which, you know, when he started talking about the Australia, UK, US submarine deal, it's like, you know, I swear, a light bulb went off over my head. It was like, bam, man, that makes, and now that makes perfect sense. Um, and he will make you consider what you think you know about China, make you rethink it. Anyhow, really terrific. It's on our YouTube channel, um, and I've sent you the link. Um, Niall, thank you very much. This has been great. Thanks for joining us from Dublin. Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is, the, I mean, watching what's happening on, on the Ireland, uh, the, the, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland is going to be really interesting over, over the next couple of decades and watch that evolve as well. That's going to be tremendous. Davey, thank you. And, and thank you to Oxford Analytica. Those of you, if you want to subscribe to Oxford Analytica, we'll send you a, a link. It's a, a great product, comes out every morning, has great update every morning, our time, thank goodness, because it's published uh, UK <laughs> time. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's got great insights on, with a level of granularity on I, every country. Is there anywhere you don't have an expert? I don't think so. 
you know, pretty much 1500 experts around the world. So it gives us the horizontal breadth to cover the world and the vertical depth to go into any industry country issue that's uh, of interest to our clients. It's great. I, I read it every morning and I recommend it to the rest of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, please um, get your friends to join the World Affairs Council. We need them. We need you. We need them. Thank you all very much. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.